Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to episode 63 of the Mind House podcast. Muhammad's with me today. Welcome back. Thank you, bro. I'm glad to be back. You know, I made it sound like you're going to be away for like three weeks and now you're well, back. It depends. We don't know when we put this out. We might put this out a bit later. I don't know. Oh, well, I've said 63 now. Messed okay, we've oh. we've put it on the, <laughs> on the map. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. So, would you like to justify your absence? I don't think I'll ever justify my absence, bro. I don't think the Mind Heist listeners are that forgiving. No, Alhamdulillah, I had a second child. Uh, Mabrook. Alhamdulillah. May Allah bless him, bro. Elias. I mean, um, which is why I was dodging sort of conversations last time. I think we were talking about like why. I, remember we were talking about Dean versus Dunya, and we were talking about why I needed a car at the time. Mm. And I almost said it. I was like, I need a car because mm. <laughs> we have obviously my second child, and yeah. it's really hard traveling. And mm. but um, anyway, sometimes yeah. it's good to. Even, for example, in your case, like straight after he's born, you're happy to talk about it on the podcast. Yeah, it's still sometimes good to keep things quiet until they actually happened, you know? Yeah. For many reasons, you know, for many reasons. But um, I just remembered actually, subhanAllah, like my cousin, I found out um, his wife gave birth recently to twins. And All right. one, I think, was dead and the other died, you know, a few days later. So oh, that's uh, yeah, you know, yeah, devastating. Yeah, Mm. I mean, you can't, I, I don't think, I can't imagine what it's like to, you know, to be holding those kids in you nine months. You finally give birth, you go through, you know, the All agony of, of giving birth and then they die. I mean, it's the, it's, it's so much, you know, physical pain, emotional pain, you know, yeah. it's crazy, man. It's crazy. Yeah. Bro. I mean, for both of, um, both of my kids, I was present during the birth mm. and, and yeah man it's something else bro something mm. else like fair enough like you know and we got a comment the other day didn't we about one of our episodes about women's role in society yeah, didn't yeah. We? someone said that oh we need a female perspective because we basically don't know what we're talking about and we can't empathize with women and blah 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 that's oh. not what was said but that's the sentiment yeah. um and in all honesty i think it annoys me the most when people we, we, the people might put us in a box that we're anti-woman when actually I'd say that we're more pro because seeing what my wife had to go through mm. why would I want her I know I'm going back into the topic like head first but why would I want her to then do that and then start worrying about work and worrying about mm. the, do you know what I mean other things mm. when actually we should be trying yeah. to make th their lives as easy as possible because once they go through something like that bro it's it's incredibly yeah, incredibly uh, yeah. eye-opening no I mean I think our I think if you listen to, okay, maybe you don't even you don't have to listen to every episode, but if you listen to five, ten episodes, you will understand where we're coming from. I don't think yeah. anybody can, people can disagree, but they can't argue that we're like anti-woman, whatever that means. Like that's a bit uh, of a very broad statement to make, anti-woman. Yeah. But I don't think you, you can say we're anti-woman. I don't think that would be a fair thing to say. You could say you're wrong for this and this reason, but you can't say we're anti-woman. That's just yeah. Not, that's not justifiable to say. So, I wanted to ask you, where, where did the name come from? Um, I'm not sure. It was really difficult. I always had names for daughters okay. in my head, but mm. with the boys after yeah. Suleiman, I didn't really know. Really? Um, okay. We kind of. It was like a last minute sort of decision where we decided on Ilias. Mm. Don't really know where it came from. I think a lot of it is just if it sounds nice, I'll go for it. Okay. Yeah. The thing is with names as well, like um. What's unfortunate is you have a lot of names that have loaded, not because of the origin. The origin of the name might be fine. Yes. But then because you've either met someone who's called some name yeah. and he's really bad or, do you know what I mean? It, it yeah. comes quite loaded and it's quite annoying sometimes. Mm. Or if someone shares a name in the family, then for some reason it's automatically like, oh off no. Off limits, yeah. Off limits, which is annoying yeah. because there are some <laughs> names that I really like, but yeah. they're already kind of taken. Yeah. So obviously, like I really like the name Adam. Okay. I've always wanted... Boy called Adam, but there's a couple of Adams in our family, and it's like, mm. no, you can't. I was like, okay, mm. fine, whatever. Mm. I think for me, Adam is actually loaded in a sense because I think a lot of the Adams I knew when I was younger were not Muslim. All right. So maybe I don't see it so much as a Muslim name, fully Muslim. And I think what would drive me nuts is English speakers saying 
Adam instead of saying Adam. Mm. So I think I'll drive me nuts. So <laughs> I don't. I think, I think I'll be staying away from that name. There is this idea that we try and choose. At least in the West, I've I've seen this idea that we try and choose names of that can easily be pronounced by both. Yes. Um, you know, Muslims and non-Muslims alike. Yeah. Um, that was my initial kind of thought process, but mm. I don't know. Like sometimes people will ask me my son's name, and I sometimes I say Solomon just to mm. give him an understanding of where that names come from. Yes. But then, like my wife would just say Suleiman. Yeah. And it's quite. Sometimes I'll say Suleiman, and I'll give them an explanation of where that name comes from. Yes. You know, um, it just depends who I'm talking mm. to, I suppose. Mm. Where did um, Suleiman come from? I think when I started practicing, I was just really fascinated by um, the Prophet Suleiman, mm. um, and just you know the, the amount of power and responsibility he was given. Yet, yeah, you know the story from like imagine just having all of that. Not only having the wealth of you know more wealth than anyone has ever had before, but also like the the all the abnormal abilities that Allah Subhanahu wa Taala gave him in terms of control over the jinn, control over the wind. Uh, yeah. ability to speak to animals mm-hmm. that kind of thing yeah, yeah i just found that phenomenal almost sci-fi-esque you know? yeah yeah um because it is one of the most <laughs> it's one of the most like i wouldn't i don't like comparing obviously but it's the reality isn't it like you see all these like netflix shows and these movies about superheroes and whatever yeah and and that just it just it was out of this world because there's mm. nothing really that loaded that, you know we've got musa alayhi salam splitting the sea uh, obviously got Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi and the miracles that he performed yeah. Isa Alayhi Salaam miracles he performed but this uh, uh, Suleiman Alayhi Salaam was like it was just like one after another like it was almost yeah. cinematic yes, the, the, yes. the things that were done on a daily basis it wasn't like one event it was like you know he could just go anywhere he wanted to based on the wind taking him there speak mm. to animals whatever like get jinns to create things it was crazy bro yeah. so <laughs> having all of that having all of that dominion mm. and still being able to be a prophet of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, still be able to have a level head and be one of the most beloved to Allah. Yeah. It's incredible, bro. Because yeah. I think I found that inspirational that you know, with with any power and with any blessing we have in this dunya, even if it's something tiny, bro, like you could get a new car and immediately you start feeling yourself. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. Or get a new outfit and immediately you start feeling yourself. Yeah. Uh, so let alone having literally everything you want in the dunya. Mm-hmm. It's crazy, bro. Mm. Crazy. I, I actually like the name for that exact same reason as well. It's really? one of the reasons that I thought in these times, okay, in the times that my son's going to be growing up, um, there's, there's a very bad, I think there's a stigma towards power and authority. Mm. And I I wanted to kind of, I aspire for my son to be powerful, have authority and wield that for the good of you know, people and for the, for the pleasure yeah. of Allah. That's what I aspire and uh, aspire to. And also, it's actually a, it's a unique name in a sense. It's quite rare. I feel um, mm. if if you think even uh, when I think of because uh, whenever I was thinking of names for my son, I always was going down the route of um, role models who, like my wife, liked another name very very much. But I was like, okay, he's in the Quran, but there's not much information. And I want something where I can tell stories. I can tell him about the traits of this person that he was named after, right? Yeah. So, so, um, so, uh, yeah, so, Suleiman, when you look at history, there's only really two Suleimans that I know of, yeah? Uh, mm-hmm. There is Suleiman the Prophet, alayhi salam, and there's Suleiman al Qanuni, the Ottoman, uh, uh, what's it called? Sultan. So, yeah. that's it, really. Um, but uh, you never know. Inshallah, one of one or both of our Suleimans will be the third one. <laughs> <laughs> you never know. At least, at least, end Allah. Anyway, so um, yeah, that's my my process is like, okay, who is a role model that we know stories about? I could tell my son he can look up to this person and be like, yes, I was named after him. I also wanted something uh, quite unique. You know, something that's not used that much. I wanted something. Um, I think the yeah, and and. And also then it was that element of having power and then using it for good. Um, mm. And I think, I think, man, like when you talk to a lot of Muslims these days about, it's not politics, okay? People put it in the category of politics, but just the idea of governance and um, power and these things, 
it's been dirtied, you know. Mm. And I feel like there's a feeling among Muslims that you shouldn't get involved in these things. But the truth is that it's absolutely necessary. Like Muslims all around the world are crying out for leaders. And it doesn't mean leaders always in the sense of governance, but even a leader like, I don't know, you're you're in the uh, university prayer room and the guy that's supposed to give khutbah hasn't turned up and it's like yeah, standing up and saying, I'll do it. You know, this is yeah. leadership as well. So uh, th there's a dire need for good leaders, right? Just because so many leaders are bad, it doesn't mean it's not necessary. Like it's absolutely necessary more than ever. So that was another thing I liked about it. But uh, yeah, man. I mean, really <coughs> having... In, in terms of like having two kids bro it's just been an absolute like shock to the system bro mm. <laughs> um it's been quite difficult i'll be honest because mm. so it's only still... been like a few days right honestly it's literally been yeah more or less a few days what is it now today's the four so it's been let's let's not count the day was born one two three this is the fourth day mm. um God, it has gone quickly. But yeah, I suppose for the event, it's only two, hmm. two and a half, and Ilyas is just born. The thing is, he's not, Suleiman's not really at the age where he 100% knows that this is a fragile baby. Okay. Um, like, he, we try to teach him gentleness and stuff hmm. like that, but he doesn't really know his own strength. Like, he'll go and hmm. he'll just run up and try and slap the baby, but that's his idea of playing. Yeah. Um, yeah, the day he tried to feed feed him a crisp <laughs> but he's been nice like it yeah. which is nice he's not but jealous at the same time you have this like overwhelming guilt because you feel like immediately you look at your son you know the oldest one in a different way mm. because i remember like a few days before i tr um i tried to make the most like i tried to have a day where i was just with my with Suleiman, just doing everything with him and playing with him and etc and now you can sort of tell that he hasn't he hasn't got the attention he had before. For example, like his mum is very tired and, and mm. focused on, on the newborn. So straight away, he's always asking for his mum and stuff. And that's been taken away because before the attention mm. was on him. Um, and you start treating him a bit older than yeah. maybe he is. A lot of different things. And you just feel a bit guilty, really. Yeah. Um, oh, and for me, like I've been focusing on Suleiman a lot, like looking after him, getting him dressed, whatever. But I haven't had much time to sit with the newborn mm -hmm. i am now like he's on my lap right now as we record this because mm. my wife's gone out um so hopefully he doesn't start perking up because i'm gonna panic <laughs> mm -hmm. um but yeah th things like this i don't i haven't really had an opportunity to speak to many people that have more than one child right a lot of the you know a lot of my peers they've only got one at the mm. moment mm. so i don't know like how over, and considering you know the, the how my job is and the shifts that I do and stuff, it's going to be a big sort of a, I don't know what you want to call it, big challenge or mm, mm. A big area of self discovery. I think definitely, it's, man. But you start thinking of all sorts of stuff now. It's like, oh, how are we going to do school runs? How are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? Mm. How are we going to travel? Um, but I know, you know, at the end of the day, we made this decision. And one thing I said to my wife was that um, if Allah, Allah will t only test us with what we can bear. Mm -hmm. And this is part of what's meant to be happening. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also an investment because having kids young and yes. having them close in age, like they're only two years apart, really. Yeah. When they're men, they're going to be inseparable in the sense that you wouldn't even know one's older than the other kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So, and alhamdulillah, they're both boys. Not, mm. Nothing wrong with having girls. I've always wanted a girl. In fact, mm. um, I was, uh, I never thought I was going to have boys. Mm. Oh, he's just thrown up on my arm. Okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, but that means there's like, there's more mahrams for the family. There's boys that can be responsible you know, it was boys be, to bring the cash, baby. Get me, baby. <laughs> but it wouldn't be. It wouldn't just be all on the ma Like all on. For example, if it was you, I mean, it wouldn't all be all on you. It wouldn't be all on me. Especially with what we've been speaking about in terms of having having men about to support the women of the family. Because mm. that's been the biggest challenge, I think, for myself uh, as a man in my own family is that there isn't that many men around. Yeah. Especially with my dad living abroad. Mm. So it's very difficult to get things done. Yeah. Uh, without burning yourself out mm. or feeling obligated to get things done for everyone and failing. Yeah. Yeah. But that, yeah. That's why I liked having a son first because I feel like when you're the eldest, like it's easier to 
uh, because they're elder, it's easier and simpler to justify why they must uh, be the leader. They must take responsibility. Yeah. And I, I, that's what I want for my son, like to teach him to be like that, especially in like modern times where growing up, like it, it kind of, it happens more naturally that the girl helps around in the house, but the yeah. boy might be left not you know, without much responsibility. So the fact that the eldest is a boy, I think I, 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 f I was happy with that because I thought like, yeah, it's going to be easier to kind of give him that extra responsibility. Mm, mm, definitely. I think you're right. It kind of makes sense. I mean, having boys first, especially more than one. I think if you have one, because I was always, I was the eldest boy. Um, I was the I'm the only boy, but being the eldest as well, mm. it made it kind of like all or nothing kind of thing. Like it's all on you sort of thing, right? Uh, for a lot of my life, so it felt mm. like it. I'm not saying it was, but it felt like oh, if I didn't do well, then mm. um, that's kind of the end of the, yeah. end of the of the line kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, so having maybe two, as long as they're raised correctly, yeah. that workload and responsibility can be shared quite well. Mm. Um, and that's something I've seen in my wife's, like in my in-laws, like there's a lot of men in her family. Mm. And so if something wrong happens, mm. it doesn't all fall on one person to sort it out. Right. Um, everybody, like all the men sort of get involved and, and, and take mm. responsibility and, and, and try and yeah. fix any problem, which yeah. is really interesting to see. Mm. There's, there's really so many benefits of having uh, not just boys or many boys or whatever, but many children in general, like. It, it is really good um, and you're right like it's front loading so like yeah. you said if you have especially if you have uh, at least two kids close together like that's good you know that that will be a investment in the long term but you know you said there's a two-year gap do you think that's like is that gap small enough because I was thinking about this recently and I was just wondering what is a gap that's like now it's like they're not close anymore um it depends really I mean <laughs> My so my sister was born when I was six. Mm. Um, for a lot of her life, I always felt like ridiculously older than her, and she didn't understand anything, and mm. we didn't connect a lot. Mm. Um, now she's about twenty. Mm. It's it's. I think everyone, like even if you look at my, even if you look at my my mum's side of the family, mm. um, like my mum got married when my youngest uncle was born. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Um, yeah. So I think so. Anyway, something along those lines, or he was just very, very young. Like he might have been Suleiman's age, trying to like that. But now they're all adults. Mm. Um, he's around thirty something. The mm. eldest one of them of the family is my oldest uncle, and he's about fifty something. Mm. But they they still go out together. They still talk to each other like yeah. adults. Do you know what I mean? So yeah. I think generally speaking, it gets to a stage where it doesn't matter anyway. Yeah, it does, as long as like they're not teenagers. But even if they are, they're still treated with a level of, you know respect that depends anyway depends what yeah what family makeup is i think but, when there's a bigger gap like let's say there's a four or five year gap yeah and let's say they're they're two brothers or two girls yeah. yeah i think when the gap is bigger they might just have completely different social circles they might like not when they're i'm talking about when they're teenagers and older yeah, yeah. well not older but the teenage years yeah mostly they might just separate right but if there was a two-year gap they might actually end up having the same friends and the younger one will be pulled upwards in terms of maturing earlier mm. kind of thing. Mm. I think that, but you know, there's like proper science around this, like especially I read one article years ago, this is around the difference between like the eldest and then the middle children and the youngest, like it has, there's a clear trend in the results that brings about, you know? Um, yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. I mean, my, my, my in-laws, so my wife's a triplet. So she's got two brothers as well. Mm. Um, and they're virtually inseparable, bro. Mm. Uh, it wasn't until they... Because they used to even work in the same place. So yeah. When I first met them, they were working mm. in the same sort of... So they'd go to the same job, have the same friends, whatever. It isn't until recently that they both ended up doing different jobs. Right. Um, that at least uh, at work, they're different. And mm. they've developed different sort of social circles because of work. But yeah. when they're at home together, they're mm. still inseparable. Mm. They still go out together. They still, so nonstop. And that's, that, I don't know if that's because they were literally raised all together. Mm. Um, or if it's just because of the same age as well. Mm. Uh, and a lot, I, I'm, I'm assuming based on, you know, watching movies and reading books and pop culture in general, that 
based on how you are raising your kids mm. determines the relationship they have with each other. So if I was to favorite one over the other mm. based on my actions and behavior and raising them, mm. then they, they might not grow being very close to each other. Mm. Uh, one might resent the other and yes. do completely different things. Mm. Um, and a lot of a lot of things, bro, like, for example, like me and my middle sister we were we spent a lot of time with my dad in the sense that he was here for a lot of our childhood whilst my youngest which we failed to realize my youngest sister uh most of her life she hasn't had her dad around mm. um and um we forget to acknowledge that because you know we automatically assume yeah your dad's always been here like what's the problem mm. kind of thing yeah. but no she'll ha she'll have different emotions towards my dad uh, she'll miss him a lot more or she'll feel like she hasn't had a father figure in her life that much mm. um and she'll be searching for that a lot mm. and and these are things bro like these can c really it just shows like small little impacts can small little things and in, in ways we raise our kids can really impact our self-esteem or the way we look at the world or the way we treat our siblings yes. um it all comes back to that bro so it's a big responsibility regardless to find mm. out how to balance things properly. Yeah, 100%. Man. Like one, one, like having this second child, and I'm going on a bit of a tangent, but having this second child has really sort of um, put some things into perspective. Like now there is no me time because mm. if I'm not, like the only me time you get is late at night, but then should you be staying up late when one of them's going to wake up early in the morning? Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's one of those ones. Like yeah. I, I had the past few days been very sleepy because mm. I thought, oh, finally, there's some rest, like we can rest. Let mm. me stay up a little bit and do the things I wanted to do. And then before you know it, so he ends up at five or six mm. um, and he's, he's sleeping with me at the moment. So he's already like jumping on me in the morning, like wake up, wake up. Mm. So <laughs> it is what it is. I am getting a taste of what it's like to be a full-time mum. Mm. Uh, because I'm literally trying to have him, but it, it makes me wonder. Like when I go back to work, because I've got a week off or so. When I go back to work, how is the missus going to cope? And I don't know how women cope generally trying to balance work and have more than one child, mm. uh, especially at different ages. It's not like yeah. you can just put them in one place. And just the thing is, it, I suppose. people do talk about oh, you can get babysitters or you can get au pairs. Mm. Um, but then what's the point of working if you're going to pay your salary to someone else to look after your kid mm. unless you you know people do have a, a goal where they're like well I want to progress my career so I go into work every day until I get a promotion until I can afford to not only pay for a babysitter but then also keep you know some. benefit yeah keep some yeah. left over yeah and it's just it's like this dream that you chase that you might never get it's true um, I mean it seems difficult to attain that level I mean I I I'm not like fully, uh, I can't say I've been in the corporate world, Yanni. Um, yeah. I had like one job like that, which didn't last very long. But what I, uh, one thing that struck me is this idea that there is immense pressure on women. Uh, this is in the West, I don't know about elsewhere. There's immense yeah. pressure on women, firstly, not to get pregnant. And secondly, when they do get pregnant, it's like, it, I feel like there's a constant pressure on them, like guilt on them like the fact that they're pregnant because their employer not just their employer first the manager their manager will be annoyed that this woman's going to have maternity leave so we have mm. to replace her yeah so that's yeah. messing up our workflow right and then the employer like the person higher up they're like oh we have to pay maternity leave and then so she's feeling guilty then when she does give birth which is difficult in itself there's pressure to come back to work as soon as possible and it's like, yeah. if you don't do that, if you take like a year out, two years out, whatever, which is not really much, but let's say you did that. Um, it's like, there's a rush to come back to work. So you don't have this big gap in your CV. And it yeah. just seems like so much pressure and it just feels so like unfair and wrong and completely not taking into account people's well-being, um, pretty much well-being in general. You know, it's really crazy. And that's another thing, bro. Like, it kind of it's trying to clash two ideas in one mm. where it's like trying to clash the employability aspect and the the breadwinner scenario mm -hmm. with the the role of a mother 
uh, what Allah has 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 made natural for 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 women, which is to have babies and give birth. Like that's something mm. that men can't do, mm. you know. But it's trying to fuse these two ideas together, and it doesn't mm. really succeed in doing so because you can't. Number one, you can't have as many kids as you wanted to anyway, because then you're like mm. you said, the gap in your employment is so large that you mm. you kind of cease to be employable anymore. Mm. You know, or you have to because accept you lower levels or whatever. Yeah, you could theoretically keep having kids until you're. Mm. So you've lost out on so much experience of work mm. and you get to an age where you already start doubting whether you're hireable like my dad had yes. that issue where he came to the uk and he was thinking about getting a job here but mm. he felt like he was just way too old to get a job mm. like he's in his 60s mm. and he's just thinking like no one's going to want to hire me yeah because he he did a lot of security work so he was just thinking i'm too old to do this kind of job anymore right yeah so physically you know I mean? uh, yeah a demanding job yeah mm. so yeah so uh that you're right like there's a clash there definitely and personally i think that in the coming like years and decades i think more women in the west will start to be honest about this and start to come out if you like mm. about this because you know we talk about taboos like oh uh depression or oh, that's a taboo or oh, um what else are these taboos we talk about um in uh, amongst muslims yani oh it's a taboo that uh, women and uh, boys and girls are treated differently. They're raised differently. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, you know, relations between man and woman. Oh, that's taboo. Yeah, these are taboos. Yeah, and we're like, oh, you know, we have to break the taboo, right? But mm. what about the taboo of this pressure that women are put under to, you know, do both and force the mother thing and the work thing and the career thing together? Uh, that I think that will come out, you know, eventually. Uh, I've seen uh, articles popping up here and there, you know, these kind of articles like, you know, I, I gay, I sacrificed having kids for my career, and now I regret it, and it's too late. And that's you know, what we're seeing. Like, in the last, I'd say the last thirty years or so, mm. there was this notion. At least I say thirty years because that's kind of what I've been around. But mm. there's been this push from Muslim women to, to say, look, I'm wearing the hijab, but look mm. how successful I am. Yeah. You know, or I'm practicing, mm. but look what what I can do. Yeah. You know. Oh, and and it's even spilled over into stuff that's questionable, which is like, mm. you know, we've seen it. Like, oh, I'm a I, I'm modest, but I'm a yeah. I'm a rapper. The first I hijabi my... um, cocaine dealer. Something like <laughs> I'm that. I'm waiting bro, for I've that seen... one to come out. Bro, I've seen one which was like first hijabi uh, heavy metal guitarist or something like this. Right. Yeah. He was in. It was either Malaysia or Indonesia, one of those sort of yeah. that kind of uh, that kind of area. Yeah. Um, but yeah, subhanallah. Yeah. Mm. Uh, what was I going to say? So yeah, but now we're kind of, and I think partly because of the the ease of the internet, the ease of social media, the ease of women having a voice, and especially especially the podcast arena. There's mm. there's podcasts that my wife listens to, and it's mm. given it's it's given. Um, strong muslim women a platform to speak mm -hmm. to express themselves in a really positive way and they they now the the, the shift is going towards why should i feel guilty mm. for being a full-time mum or wanting to raise my kids mm. or not wanting to assimilate to the rest of what yeah. society demands of me right mm. and it's a bit it's having that that pride mm. because bro we can't deny that like we've had it we've had it like drilled into us like you know, you, you go and study and you get A grades and then you go to university and then you go mm. and do medicine, you go and do dentistry, you go do something like engineering or whatever. And um, yeah, there's challenges along the way. Or maybe you should take that hijab off because people aren't going to hire you or whatever. And mm. it was kind of what I was speaking about in terms of my employment. You know, I, I, I was speaking to my employer about this because I had a bit of a crisis episode because I didn't know if I wanted to do the job I'm doing. And I, I said to them, I don't know if I came here or joined this industry join this organization sorry because i wanted to mm. or because i was trying to prove something to people and say oh i've got a beard and i'm a practicing muslim but look even i could do xyz right. do you know what i mean and that was a big sort of thing uh right. on the come up of joining this organization was that mm. a lot of people like my father or my father-in-law people who might may not be visibly religious in terms of you know having the symbols of islam like a beard and the thobe and whatever uh, mm. saying hey you're not employable if you carry your deen like this or you're visible about your deen mm. or you're vocal about your deen you're not employable and yes we got pressures like the climate of extremism and whatever like even what was it a couple of days ago there was another mm. I don't know terror motivated stabbing in London mm. 
you know, and, and I've just I just came back from the shop earlier looking at the front page news and it's like jihadi this and yeah. jihadis on our streets and stuff. And again. To be honest, I haven't been in tune with news that much and I'm quite surprised that that rhetoric is still front page news. Mm. You know, I thought it kind of died out a while ago, but mm. it's still quite prominent. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so, yeah, it's a very real pressure and I don't know, I haven't actually thought about my kids yet. Obviously, they're quite young, but how their dean is going to play into like how do you raise kids to be religious in this climate you mm. know how do you speak to your son about a beard that's like mm. something that's something that no one's ever spoken to me about yeah. no one's ever told me to do that i kind of discovered on my own but then how do you instill that into your kids mm. you know um yeah but yeah so uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of shifts that are going on ultimately what i'm trying to say is that it's good that there are women that have this voice uh given to them now a platform given to them to be proud and counteract what what is expected yeah. which is you know oh yeah fine keep that hijab on but you know um be 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 a successful entrepreneur be that, not saying there's anything wrong with that we know that but not at the expense of other mm. muslims to feeling guilty for carrying out a role that actually is one of the, one of the most important roles in the family if not the important role yeah 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 and like i said like that is going to come out um eventually and even it's going to come out from non-muslims i have no doubt about that because there's only so much like pressure and going against the, the natural state that you can achieve before yeah. you start to break you know and there are many w ways in which that plays out like for example, uh, the individualism that is going on in many societies now, there's only so long before that breaks because it's so against the norm in terms of... Uh, it's it's basically against the natural state to be yeah. so obsessed with yourself and thinking of yourself and dealing only with yourself and only being surrounded by yourself, if you like. And yeah. that's why... I mean, I'm reading a book now. Maybe we'll do an episode about it. But one of the key reasons for depression is loneliness and it is a yeah. lack of connection to other people. So all of these uh, more newer phenomenon, not all of them, but some of them, they're going to boil over. People are going to start going the other way, you know. So yeah. anyway, bro, may Allah make it easy. Put Baraka in, in uh, your time with your son and, um, you know, make it easy for you, man, and strengthen you to be able to carry out the task in the best way. And, uh, yeah, I mean, if there's any listeners, yeah. if there's any listeners that have gone through it, sort of thing, it'd be good to um, hear some of their input and get some emails sent down because I, 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 you know, we read all the emails and it's really interesting. Sometimes if there's something that's good, we we like to kind of dedicate a whole episode to it. So please mm. do. What What is that specifically you wanted to hear? From so, like, if on? there's like, um, <clears throat> sorry, if there's uh, any listeners that have had more than one kid or they've got kids that are similar mm. ages like this mm. um how they managed it how they mm. balanced their time mm. and and i i don't like um i don't i want to hear the real deal i don't want to hear like oh you have to do this and you have to do that i want to see how it physically played out mm. because we all know what we have to do it's just what what we actually do how it actually plays out yes more, yes you yeah, know that's I mean? true. yeah that's a good point okay but i wanted to actually you mentioned it briefly but i wanted to actually just uh make a point on this uh, comment we got which i actually found it very ironic okay so we got a comment uh, from episode 60 which was the episode we we were asked about um women's role in the society uh by a woman we were asked and so we did an episode on it i think it was very insightful episode good episode um yep. so this uh i'm guessing it's a woman she said this was painful to listen to you need a woman's perspective <laughs> and i thought the reason it's ironic is because Every episode we say, um, email us, contact us, give us your view, give us your comments. So it's like we're asking for a woman's perspective, and I guess this is a woman, and yet she didn't give us... She said you need a woman's perspective, but then she didn't give it to us. Like She could have yeah. given us her perspective. So that's a shame. But, um, you know, we're open. I think we're both open to... Uh, any kind of uh, c comments whether it's you're agreeing with us you're against us whatever um mm. and other thing i wanted to say is I, I think what she actually was what she meant to say perhaps is you need my perspective yeah right? that's what i was going to say because yeah. 
what what that comment does is that it invalidates every woman that would have ever agreed with us. Exactly, yeah. Which because is, you, we know is not true because we have wives, we have mothers, exactly. we, you know, we have some idea surely yeah. of what and women. I, and I think there is think. this notion that maybe whether we have strong opinions or not, that we're imposing those strong opinions upon our wives who are silent victims. Yeah. When actually, then, well, at least you know, I can speak for my own wife that she definitely isn't like she's mm. more vocal than than me about this same topic and about the things that I've said because at the end of the day I never experienced the benefit of what we've spoken about the structure that we have until she she suggested it she wanted it like I said in the last in that episode I think it was mm. I never got into my marriage expecting my wife to stay at home yeah like that wasn't an expectation I just thought as you know the the mainstream might think is that yeah we both work and whatever it wasn't until that decision that she came to that conclusion that then I saw the benefits of it mm. so there you go like don't you can't invalidate say by saying you need a woman's perspective like yeah. a woman is defined as someone who disagrees with you yeah exactly you know? like as it's as if it's it i believe it's one of the plots of shaitan to i think shaitan has a core conflicts that he likes to fan the flames to one of them is men versus women one of them is the rich versus the poor you know um yeah. one of them is I can't think of the third one, but these are two ones that have played out throughout time. And as Muslims, we have to uh, be like Allah says in the Quran, "Oliya u You know, we have mm. to be uh, helping and and helping friends of each other and and allies to each other. And so the the Muslim men and the Muslim women need to be allies, of course, towards working towards what's pleasing to Allah. Yeah, and the mm. same with the rich and the poor. You know, the for example, the socialist communist idea that the rich are all evil that's not within islam yani we're all brothers and we need to work together and help each other kind of thing so mm. um so yeah like all women uh, don't have the same opinion and we do have women's uh, perspectives but if you want to share your perspective your unique you know you, you don't you're not going to speak for all women you know you, mm. you just can't do that so if you want to share your opinion then no problem email us and uh, perhaps we'll be wrong you know, one thing that I kind of realized I've been wrong about is um, the role of women in um, more traditional societies, if you like, in terms of like their contribution in, in working. Right. Mm -hmm. So you you talked about women working in the, the fields in Tunisia. So I thought I would ask my dad about that. You know, uh, what's it? Oh, yeah. What was that like? What's it like in Algeria? What you, was it like in Algeria? And my dad uh, said it was a very good point, very interesting. He said that um, women and children, he said even children, they would, everyone would work in the fields because uh, you had to. There, there wasn't, you needed as much manpower as you could get. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so he said, you know, the women, the, 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 thing, the thing that stood out for me was that the women had jobs that women would do and men had jobs that men would do. Yeah. And it, they would do it together. You know, uh, for example, like I, I guess I got hints of this uh, being you know, visiting Algeria many times is that stuff like if the men were going to harvest the crops, the women might, you know, you have to like clean stuff out. So like, oh, yeah. for example, exactly, almonds, yeah. like almonds, yeah. they have that green layer around them. You have to take that off and then you have to take the other layer off and then you got the actual almond like the, you might see women doing that all together. You yeah, know? exactly. So, there was still separation of sexes, but by necessity, the women would be uh, working in, in farming because it's it's a task that requires uh, a, as much manpower as possible before a lot of the modern technology came out. Uh, but also yeah. equally, you know, you would have, you know, 11, 12 year olds contributing as well, again, out of necessity. So I think maybe the idea of like 1950s America, where it's like, um, American dream, the woman's at home, the, 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 the man goes out to work. I think that is a modern um, luxury. And I think it's good. Like, I made that clear. I think it's good. Um, be, be, but the 1950s America kind of model or image that was made possible because of um, uh, changes in the, in the way people work or stuff like that, right? Mm. Um, so... So, yeah, I think that was out of necessity. But the key thing is that women were doing certain jobs that women would do. And it was always separated and stuff like that. It was, I think, very different, perhaps, to the office culture that we have these days in many, like, quote unquote, um, developed countries. Yeah, of course. Like, even going back to that field analogy, like, I think I mentioned, like, yeah, the women would work the fields. 
Um, and then there would be if there's like heavy machinery like tractors or har- combine harvesters whatever you'd see men sort of driving that and, and doing that mm. um, so and, and a lot of women would I remember like one of my aunts would discuss going back to work um, when you know she felt like she wanted a bit more money or whatever and she would talk about jobs like factory jobs or you know basically it's it's basically where a lot of women would work in one place mm. uh or doing the same thing mm. um together as opposed to competing with men yes. um and, and at the end of the day like especially you know if you think back to women that are in these countries uh that have a lot of culture that instills modesty into them anyway they wouldn't want to be in an arena with men regardless mm. you know they no don't doubt, see yeah. that as appealing whatsoever to be in that environment or to challenge yeah. that you know yeah. um it's quite odd to see yeah. um so i don't know what you know there, mm. there's a lot of w- women that might disagree with that but in terms of reality and how it plays out that like that's mm. that's what women want that women don't want to be uncomfortable yeah, yeah. in an arena and you, you have know? to like we have to admit yeah like more traditional societies today and and even before had a more it, it's obvious to me at least that there was more of an influence of islam in the culture right yeah so obviously like if you're living in a non-muslim country you're gonna be the culture's influenced by ideas other than islam and they make certain things normal and not normal yeah but yet in muslim societies the culture is very much influenced by Islam. And so even if there isn't like a specific ruling on something, the the norm that comes about in a society will often be influenced by Islam. And that's an example of what you gave, you know, like women did not did not uh, gather and, and work with men and mix with men. They had their own role, which was separate from the men and yeah. vice versa. So, yeah. Um, okay, bro. So we got cut off last episode. Uh, well, the one before that, uh, episode 61 uh talking about dunya versus akhirah okay and um i asked you a question which now i want to hear the answer to (laughs) which is i'm going to reword it though slightly um the 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 issue not of dunya versus akhirah but the the issue of desires versus akhirah i think it's a better way of wording it right because like we said the dunya is just a tool for good or bad yeah but desires is something and akhirah is something and very much i feel like uh, it, there is a choice between one or the other yeah and we'll get yeah. into the examples of that but do you think like enough has been said by duat by you know the te- teachers that we hear from to emphasize this point that there is desires and there's the pleasure of allah and often you have to pick one over the other and basically sacrifice has do you think that's been communicated enough? Because I just don't feel it has been. So in terms of what sacrificing desires so that you could attain. Yes. Yes. So, yes. I like I've got the feeling that you can live an almost luxurious lifestyle, basically, which is great for your desires, and you know, be the first guy into Jannah, pretty kind of thing. Oh, is that is that what you're talking about? So you're yeah. saying that's what they're promoting the most. I, I just it's a feeling right i can't say it's uh, i don't know i think it, i would say the opposite i think if anything there's more or there's historically at least been more of the sacrifice your sacrifice this sacrifice that like don't chase the dunya you know you get those even now you get like those um i know like one path network do a lot of these kind of videos where they're quite cinematic mm. they're showing like lamborghinis and stuff like that and then saying that you know the dunya is finite you don't chase it kind of mm. thing i think that's always been the consistent thing i think what we are lacking is what you were saying um maybe because you <clears throat> it depends what we're exposed to because yeah I don't necessarily watch stuff like that anymore. Mm. Um, not because it's bad. I just, I don't know. I haven't had the time. Mm. Um, and I don't, sometimes I see it with benefit, but in all honesty, I think I've heard it so much that I'd rather just hear it from the Quran as opposed to someone telling me. Sure. You know, because I've, you know, I know what they're saying. It's, it's just a bit more empowering for me if I hear it. Directly. Or I read it on the Quran, etc. And I'm more interested in. Mm. I suppose right now my interest lies more in fiqh mm. uh, because there's so many life changes and so many day to day questions that I have. Yeah. Um, that I'm not just about being iman boosted, mm. you know? Because mm. uh, a lot of things with fiqh as well is like, <clears throat> especially when you're like, you know, you get married, you've got kids, the questions that they're going to have for you, the things you run into, 
uh, it's not just about yourself anymore. So you've got to think about practical application of Islam mm. for not just yourself, but for everyone involved. Yeah. Um, so yeah, as far as, but I think in, in all honesty, I think the Dawah scene, at least online, which is arguably where a lot of people get most of their deen from nowadays, mm-hmm. um, unless they're students of knowledge or they're attending classes. I think that's, I think that there's been a lot of a broader spe- spectrum now. Mm. Um, I think early on, at least maybe on, Five ten years ago, it was a lot of um, you know inspirational this and quotes and you know thirty second clips of of a speaker and you know cinematic videos and nasheeds in the background and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah. But now, like I think I've touched upon this before. <clears throat> now you're getting a bit more, getting a bit more substance, a bit, a bit more variety. Mm, variety. Certain, yeah. yeah. Certain people are specialising in certain things, it's focusing on certain books. Mm. Um, dabbling into more uh, nuance like not politics but like not everything was rosy kind of thing like let's talk about the things that we don't talk about um, because <clears throat> I think maybe the I think maybe people are at least the the shuyuk and stuff are becoming more aware that actually they're getting more be- more viewers on their live stream than they are getting attending the, the actual class at the masjid mm. you know? and that's not because people aren't attending the masjid uh, instead, it's because they've got a global reach now. Mm. You know, like mm. I don't know, let's pick up like Green Lane Meshed, for example. I, they're very good at live streaming everything they they do, more or less. Mm. Um, and arguably, you get more views there than you do at the Meshed because you're you're getting people like me down in Brighton watching it, or yeah, of people from overseas. You know, and, and the message is touching everyone, mm. and you're getting like movements. I mean, look at Hadith Disciple as one. Mm. Like you can get the Hadith Disciple hoodie and get the Hadith mm-hmm. Disciple this and that, and that's not because. Um, it's not because they're calling to themselves or promoting themselves only or exclusively. It's mm. about the movement and celebrating that movement and celebrating a love for seeking knowledge mm-hmm. and being part of something a bit, you know, a bit special. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, ultimately to get to answer your question, I'd argue different. I'd say that if anything, the message of being successful and successful in this dunya and successful in the akhirah. I think there hasn't been too much of that in terms of practical application because I think the audience for who can realistically achieve that is quite small mm-hmm. um, because success in the dunya mm. tends to be you know money and wealth and and, and making it big mm-hmm. um, and what happens is that generally a lot of people that are f- always focused on that or want to attain that have never generally speaking as far as I can see don't tend to be people that were that interested in religion Mm-hmm. Interested in Dean? Unfortunately, um, mm. there are the few that you find that have um, either come from that kind of lifestyle. For example, you get some reverts that have uh, used to be millionaires or whatever. I've seen a few of those, and they've come to Islam. Mm-hmm. And a lot of them have like because of the way they made that money, they may have shunned it, shunned that lifestyle. Mm-hmm. Uh, for example, uh, let's let's take a uh, Mutabil, you know, the, Napoleon. Yes, um, I follow him on Instagram. I've spoken mm. to him a couple of times. And um, I think Liberic, I think he's still got you know uh, quite a bit of wealth, and he's opening businesses. Like I know he's got um, uh, one or two restaurants in in Saudi. He's got a coffee shop that he's just opened up. Like he's doing stuff, mm-hmm. you know. But if you think about where he came from, mm. it's a different kind of wealth now. It's not like look at my Rolls Royce and look at my Lamborghini or whatever. Mm. It's like building empire mm. building kind of thing. It's like building a legacy, building it's wealth, not riches, kind of thing. Okay. Um, so I think what needs to be done more, which I do, I do see existing, is a discussion, a frank discussion about money, a mm. frank discussion about utilizing money for the benefit of the Ummah. Because, you know, how many lectures do you get about, how many Jumas do you go to where it's like, oh, give charity, give charity, give charity, but no one wants to talk about where that money comes from or how that money's made or what's mm, the best way of making more point. money. Yeah, yeah. Like it's candid, isn't it? It's like, I'll give your money, um, but I won't tell you how to make money or you know, make sure your money's halal, but there's no actual substance to what's being said. Okay, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. But the, the, on the same side, you know, shuyuk and ulama and imams of the masjid aren't exactly financial experts to be giving that advice. That's so there true. should be, there needs to be a, a middle ground of people. And I do see some, like, uh, I know Sheikh, um, I don't know if it's Sheikh Usted, uh, or whatever you want to call him, but Usted, um, Joe Bradford, mm-hmm. um, Came across him. I think I believe he's a reaver, and he's he graduated from 
from Medina. I think he might have a master's. I could be wrong. Yeah. But in finance and stuff, yeah. finance stuff like that. Yeah. But he's just focused on finance, bro. Focus on yeah. making money. Does workshops and stuff mm. like that. Mm. Um, but not. But all of these bro- brothers that you see that do this, they're not like talking about uh, riches and talking about cars and stuff. They're talking about investments. They're talking yeah, they're about, talking about, it might be the more mature, responsible side exactly. of things. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And lately there's been discussions like this and I've come across them. There's been people that, you know, white kufi, white thobe, wouldn't even cross your mind about their income. And they're, they're, they're wealthy, bro. And they'll talk about, you know, you know I remember watching an mm. hour long or two hour long um, video that uh, Dawa man did with a, uh, I believe is a student of knowledge and it was all about cryptocurrency and bitcoin mm. and i think allah alam not suspicious but i think imran dawa man did this thing initially thinking that bitcoin was impermissible mm. um, and this student of knowledge that he brought on basically didn't really focus initially on the islamic side of it just focused on the history of it and what it means and yeah. then showed how that applies to actually what we're using today mm. like the money that we use today is only is only a um uh, like put in place and in control of governments as opposed to having an objective value that was set like gold did you know gold was set because gold was objectively set because there's only a limited quantity of it yes you know yeah. money can be printed mm-hmm. however many times so it automatically falls in control of of governments that have those printing machines right yeah, yeah. and they can change the value of it up and down based on how mm. much they print mm. and then cryptocurrency in essence was created in essence that it, it has a set value as well because it can you can't produce more bitcoin than there is in the world if yeah. you know what i'm trying to say yeah yeah um anyway but just that sentence like w- w- that wouldn't have been that wouldn't have existed in islamic discussions or yeah. masjid mm. 10 years ago it just wouldn't have been had because people would have thought oh you're talking about the dunya leave the dunya outside yeah you know um but the but truth is these... you need the dunya to make progress in very important parts of of exactly. life in terms of helping exactly. people in their akhirah, you know. Yeah, and, and I think a lot of Muslims, at least from our generation, and, you know, Muslims such as yourself, have seen uh, are in desperate need of... Um, they found, like, they've they found themselves watching entrepreneurship videos. They found themselves watching Gary Vaynerchuk and, and, and mm. Tony Robbins and these kind of people. And they found it inspiring, but, like, only 50% inspiring because the mm. other 50% they feel guilty about because this person is swearing left, right, and center, or they're talking about wine companies, or they're talking about things that are... Do you understand? Like, yeah. f- let's say Gary Vaynerchuk, for example. Sweet, you're very motivating. Like, the things you say kind of make sense, but yeah. you want to invest in TikTok, which I don't want to invest in. You yeah. made, your, you made you know, your first big chunk of money in selling alcohol. Mm. I don't want anything to do with that. You know, yeah. you, you own Gary... You, what was it? VaynerMedia... Meaning mm-hmm. that um, a lot of your videos and productions that you do and amazing YouTube quality videos you do are full of music and full of this and full of... Do you understand? Like, yeah. we, we, we want those lessons. It's the same with the books that we're reading, like Ego is the Enemy and, and The mm-hmm. Obstacles Away and these self-help books. Like, we are finding value and we, we've, de- we've detected that Muslims have a need for this content, mm-hmm. but we don't have it in a way that we can fully consume it guilt-free yeah. or fully consume it and, and, and believe it all mm-hmm. because, like, I can read... And I can take, I can watch like hours and hours of these kind of self-help things, but then realize that half of it I can't agree with. Like people make businesses out of thin air because they're taking loans out. Like, no, I don't want to know that. I want to know mm. the hard way of doing it. I want to know the halal way of doing it. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we do need more people that are conscious mm. Islamically and mm. talk about the actual step-by-step process of how you know, you can manage your money, manage mm. your finances, become sex- mm. successful in the dunya and use that wealth in the dunya yeah. to serve your akhir. Yeah, And I think the old school narrative, I'm talking about maybe 20 years ago, was Muslims can't, shouldn't be rich. Like Muslims mm. shouldn't aim to be rich. Muslims should wear a thobe and sell itar outside the masjid. Yeah. You know, and... If you don't like that lifestyle of, of getting by on the minimum amount of money, then you're just not a Zahid and you love the dunya, you know. Yeah. And then we went to, I feel at least we went to another phase, which was like, um, no, like, get that fancy car, um, upgrade your house, uh, you know, get those designer clothes. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, pray and this and that. Yeah. But now maybe we perhaps we're going into a third phase where it's like more nuanced, where it's like, okay, go out there, do your job or business with Ihsan, get money from that because you're good at it. 
right? Yeah. And you're providing value. But then when you get that money, what do you do with it? Do you get that fancier car? Do you get that uh, designer clothes? Or do you put it like either the Joe Bradford thing, which is or like, you know, Wahid Invest has been doing huge campaigns around yeah. responsibly investing your money. Or is it like, um, I want to actually set up a waqf because that's like so long term in terms of charity or etc. So yeah. maybe like, I just thought actually that if you think about it, yeah, like uh, when when were different countries made independent from colonization, like Algeria, 1962, um, uh, India, uh, 1971, I think, like, yeah. it's not been that long, right? And during colonization, and then soon after it, we've kind of been handicapped a little bit in terms of our uh, scholarship and stuff. And in terms of mm. adapting to what has changed so much, like in the la since co colonization, the world has changed like so much. And yet, we were at a we were kind of trying to catch up from all those years lost during colonization, right? Because, you know, let's be real, they had bigger things to worry about rather than, yeah. you know, what's the ruling on, you know, even mortgages, like mortgages probably didn't exist in the countries, um, etc. We, we Muslims hadn't moved to the West yet on mass and all of that. They had bigger issues to deal with, you know, being colonized and stuff. So uh, even the, you know, like in Algeria, they tried to destroy the Arabic language. Um, I think Tunisia, same thing. Oh, um, yeah, definitely. Egypt, the, the, across these countries, there's been plots to destroy the knowledge of the Arabic language, right? So... We had b bigger things to worry about. But now that it's been 50, 60 years, whatever, since colonization has ended, I mean, quote unquote, ended, um, yeah. uh, maybe now we could start to actually catch up and actually develop our own thoughts around these things, you know, and have these more mature and nuanced discussions around, um, you know, okay, this guy made, you know, $50 million from his tech company. What's he going to do with it? Like Bill Gates yeah. is using his wealth for X, Y, Z. What's the model like for a Muslim? Like where's the highest leverage place to put your money and all of that. So that's really healthy, I think. And mm. that's my mindset, Yanni, is that uh, I do intend to like make a lot of money, like above average. I do feel the duty in a way to do that. But then, and this is the thing, the, the desires versus the akhirah thing. I'm actually thinking more recently about keeping, not going down the route of, I can afford a, a fancier car, I can afford a nicer house, I can afford designer clothes. So buy that, like still give charity, but buy that stuff. I'm actually thinking now, no, like how do I justify buying those things? And so, yeah. you know, you see what I mean? Like I'm, I'm thinking more in the sense of like, how can I sacrifice those desires and then put that, what I've saved from sacrificing it towards something which will help me in the akhirah. But that's why I, I want to ask you now, what is like the limit to that? Because, you know, if you, if you, for example, uh, I want to give a good example that's not cliche, but if you don't invest in things that make your life comfortable, especially for yeah. your, for your family, you might be handicapped in other parts of your life, such as like wasting your time. Uh, going to fix your car, for example, in the garage because you yeah, have a cheaper yeah, car. I guess so. so, like, I what think, what's the line, man? I think for yourself, I mean, you've got mm. a fascination with time and and maximizing it. Mm. Um, I think I've this I've sort of found this notion of looking after yourself by having things that you're interested in and things that you can't, you don't have to question whether you want to do it or not. Like, basically, you have to learn to accept that you're going to be judged as an individual not based on the collective of, of, of Muslims in a sense that you know something that I might purchase for myself or use or do for myself is something that you might think is completely like a waste of mm. time a waste of money whatever. Sure, yeah. but the benefit that that does to my mind and my well-being mm. might be something that you'll never understand like mm. it won't apply to you like you won't get the same out of it um, and I think part of that is like finding things that you are still interested in that might have no no um no you know direct correlation to your akhira mm. but keep you going like having a portion of this world yes yes for yourself you're you know for you if you're comfortable in doing that and maximizing that and having complete like a everything has to be one-to-one -one. yeah so everything i do has to have an output that directly correlates to the akhira mm. um 
then go for it like more power to you yeah. you know <laughs> and yeah. have the left of that but at mm. the same time being a parent now and having a son you've yeah. got to also acknowledge that your son isn't going to well might not be like that whatsoever yeah, yeah, yeah. you know they, they might they might have things that they're going to and you're, I think you're going to see it the most when you have your son because your son is going to grow up and he's going to be interested in things that have no purpose mm. apart from to entertain him whether yes. that's toys or certain hobbies or things that he yeah. I don't know if he's going to be homeschooled or not but whatever you know things mm. that He's, he's got interested in I think like so there, there should be things I think mm. you but you I'm with hard, you on that should I be, think there should be like a hobby that you have bro mm. that you can just go hard on that yes, can, yeah that can like something even like fishing like okay imagine yeah. you just just really got into fishing right? yeah so you spent like you dropped a big wad of money on like this really expensive rod yeah with all the kit mm. right and you subscribe to this monthly magazine or, mm. or do you know what I mean mm-hmm. or you go out every I don't know every month or two with a bunch of guys and go out on a boat and spend a bunch of money doing that yeah right then and then you could say to yourself that was a waste of money mm. or you could say that actually you're you're looking after a bit of your own health and well-being yes, um, yes. And doing something for yourself and I think that's something you can easily burn yourself out on because yeah exactly yeah you're going on you know you're, you're doing a lot in terms of um, serving others and, and everything has to add up and everything's a business because it's all business minded really even thinking about the air it's like how much can I invest and yeah. what can I get out mm. <clears throat> that sometimes you need to just unplug come back to problems that are a bit more sorry I'm just picking up the ears um, come back to problems with a fresh mindset you know um, and it's everything's not like giving, giving yourself something to look forward to yes. that's also good I think yeah. that's something I struggle with is uh, like when you get burnt out at work or burnt out working hard mm. you want to have something you can think oh I'm going to get such and such in a few years like a lot of my friends um, that are, you know all money motivated in a sense and they're all very very religious practicing brothers um, they're just fascinated with cars bro they just mm. all they couldn't talk about like in amongst each other is cars you know when they're not talking about Dean obviously mm. <laughs> talk about cars sharing images of cars new cars cars that they want to buy stuff like this but yeah. then that's all they're really interested in Mm. Um, you wouldn't find them being fascinated by anything else. And mm. That's quite a typical hobby. Like it's not taking up a big portion of their mind space, basically. No, it's not. But oh, it's like the only thing that takes up some. No, no, exactly. Yeah. For some people, yeah, it is it is. And I think that's what you've got to realize. Like some people can go hard, and I think you're one of those people that goes hard on their responsibilities uh, and goes in hard on what mm. needs to be done. Mm. Um, which the reason why I not, not that I worry but I think you're going to have to be conscious about is what impact that has on your child and the connection you can have with your son mm. because you're going to want to instill in your child yeah things that, you know every action has a consequence and you should always yeah. invest in your akhira but at the same time there's going to be things that mean nothing whatsoever yes. that you're going to have to do and you're going to want mm. to do mm. and being enthusiastic mm. about yeah. because that's what's going to create bonds mm. memorable bonds yeah, with yeah. your, your yeah. child yeah well, I'm I'm on the same page with you on that. Like, yeah, yeah. and I think maybe I am. I'm re- misrepresenting myself, or I've been misrepresented on the podcast, right? <laughs> oh no! <laughs> because, because um, I, like I said uh, on another podcast, I'm very forgiving for myself. So, yeah. although I aspire to have the resilience and the discipline to pretty much everything I do from when I wake up to sleep is in one form or another like productive and for the sake of Allah yeah that is an aspiration and I do admit I would like to get to that level but the fact that I'm nowhere near that level I'm okay with because I understand you need like you said take care of your well-being right yeah. so I definitely have things like that for example for me like reading is one where it's like I recognized that if I read every day and I learn something every day I feel really good like I'm like I'm get, I'm making progress in my life, yeah. Yeah. So that so I I do that. Like I force that into my into my uh, morning where I read every single morning. I make sure I read right. So you, I can say there isn't a one to one output for reading because some of the things I'm learning I might not apply. It might yeah. just be general knowledge. I mean I try to pick books that will help, but like it's one of those things that you're saying that it doesn't have the one to one output right and then mm. i've mentioned before you know i go climbing if i had people to play with i'd be playing football one two times a week yeah. um all of this i think what i do try and do though is for example my friends that i sometimes see in dubai and stuff 
I'm always like moaning at them to do like when we meet up, can we please like do something rather than sitting around and just having a coffee together? Really, and so yeah. that's the kind of thing I'm trying to do where it's like I'm meeting up with them partially is for well-being and not getting burnt out and all of that. Yeah. But it's just I want to spend the time with that well-being time. I want to spend it at least have some element of benefit in it. And yeah, okay. for me, at least, that's maybe my balancing thing. That's the middle ground is where it's like, yes, do things to not burn out. Do things that are not one to one out output thing. But like, yeah. don't like spend two hours like yeah let's go shopping you know let's yeah let's go you know uh, go have a meal like having a meal like every single week and like that's three four hours you're just sitting chilling eating talking yeah and that's okay but it's like i feel like we could have be having even more enjoyment together with something beneficial like a yeah. sport or you know what i mean yeah i suppose if you're going to do it then you want to do it properly as opposed to just mm. Waste. yeah i guess so yeah like i can't remember the last time i went saw anybody it's been a few months now Allah. Um, you see that's know. a that's a well-being thing isn't it like yeah and like seeing like, people I, I, i'm not trying to give a sob story I, mm. I, it's actually been it has actually been like maybe two or three months i can't remember mm. um but and i mean like nobody like i haven't seen anyone mm. of my family but what i have noticed is like yeah it will it I will feel a certain type of way, but the moment I go and see them, bro, mm. and yeah, we will do nothing. Like we mm. can just sit uh, or eat or whatever mm. because it's so rare. Yeah, that's I value true. that so much. And that mm. drive home that I have afterwards, mm. I just feel like a million dollars, bro. I feel mm. on top of the world. Yeah, it's really yes. good for me. Yeah, um, that's and that, these are the sort of things I'm talking about. Like mm. sometimes you just got to do something for yourself. Yes, you know? yes. Um, because if you're not charged it up, you can't give back to those that you are responsible for. Yeah, I agree, hundred percent. Otherwise, otherwise yeah. you just take it out. You kind of take it out on them in a way. Yeah, mm. which is really bad. Yeah, um, not in a bad way. Like you just won't be enthusiastic with them, or you won't no. be able to 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 give to bring in anything into the house that is positive. Yeah, hundred percent. This is I, all you've got. Mm. And I guess it's, it's like, about self awareness, isn't it? Like yeah. knowing knowing what is enough for you to have that recharge. Um, mm. versus when you've crossed the line and you're going into just purely indulging too much kind of thing. Mm. Oh, yeah, exactly. And that is, that's probably the danger I fall in more is just um, probably using escapism too much mm. <laughs> um, and trying to find a balance and mm. get back on track. Mm. Mm. Um, now, I would argue uh, as well that there are forms of escapism that are a lot more revitalizing, recharging than others, right? Oh, so like. Course. I know like it's difficult if you don't have certain, you know the right people around you or whatever but playing five aside football is going to recharge you way more than playing FIFA. You know yeah, what I mean? Yeah. No, definitely. Mm. Definitely. You know somebody who uh, you you know we've talked about um the way like we see money and we the way we use money. Somebody that I re always enjoy when they talk about this topic is uh, Sheikh Tawfiq Chaudhry. Um he's somebody oh, yeah. that uh, you know, he uh, founded uh, Mercy Mission, which uh, out of Mercy Mission came National Zakir Foundation, um, a few charities, Al Kothar Institute. And, um, you know, he seems to really know what he's talking about when it comes to money. And he's very much in touch with the way like the Sahaba dealt with money. And he mm -hmm. talks about that. And I remember there's one interview he did and he's like, you know, I talked to my son and my son like earned some money. And then I was like, give give 20 percent away like just get used to giving 20 percent away yeah you know and he's like you know challenge yourself how much can you give away you know he's like talking about uh was it abdurrahman bin auf like he gave like all his money and then it still came back and then he's like trying to give it away all again and so it's like this is where when you question yourself like okay how much am i gonna give away and all of that and then you think oh no but i've got to get this and this and then it's like it's good questions to ask isn't it like okay I can't give away 20%, but why can't I give 20? Oh, because I've got this and this. Okay, but that yeah. is like, that is my like money that I'm spending on hobbies and stuff, which is important for my uh, my development even and my recharging and stuff like that. But that part, now that's kind of like purely just pure desire. So yeah, let me take that 5% and I'll actually give it away. And then maybe Allah will give me more. And, you know, this is the, I think it feel like at least it's like closer to the like true Muslim mindset. Um, and I think we we uh, dis explored it well together, Yanni. The different 
parts of it. Um, trying to be productive, still having that, um, still having the recharging aspect, not burning out aspect, uh, mm. being responsible. It's all good, bro. It's all, but it ultimately, like you said, it's all about knowing yourself and then acting based on yourself, your own boundaries. Setting those boundaries is, is also quite, it's quite per- pertinent. Um, it's difficult, I suppose, because you're, you're kind of you're going between like things that you have to do and then so like you've got responsibilities that you have to do yeah and you go through those but then it depends how much of that takes up your time mm-hmm. um and then can you justify when you've got like a lot let's say you, you're constantly like every day you've got something to do and then you get that one day and i think i've mentioned this before you get that one day where you, suddenly you've got, you haven't got to do anything mm. you're like oh should i do something productive Mm. Which I just just like waste, and that's what it is really. It's just like waste all of this time. Yeah. But um, having your iman on check and 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 like I remember when I used to go up to these see these brothers, bro, and would have like a very in depth conversation about Dean or mm. someone would share a very important reminder, or if I went to a conference or some sort of lecture or something, mm. I come back, bro, thinking, bro, you know what? I'm gonna get rid of everything that distracts me. I'm gonna basically do what you you're kind of aspiring to do. Mm. Just get rid of everything. Everything has to have a one to one output. Yeah. Um, it's like listening to any sort of motivational thing, and then suddenly you've got this surge of motivation mm. that isn't necessarily gonna last long mm. because there's no motivation yeah. that you need. Yeah, you need you need discipline. Mm. Um, but maybe taking steps, I suppose, putting limits on and and relying on uh, systems as, because. For myself, I've noticed I've had to kind of succumb to this realization that I can't do it on my own unless I have systems mm. uh, in place. I used to hate this idea of putting systems in place. Mm. Uh, I'm still quite averse to it because I didn't like the idea that I had to rely on anything outside of my own willpower. Mm, that's do, common, yeah. Yeah, to do things like you know, you know, like, like get screen time on your phone, yeah, or like limiters on your entertainment systems, yeah, uh, or blocking things on your website, yeah. or like on your computer, like you've got mm. uh, Facebook and stuff. I used to hate that idea because I just mm. thought, why would I, why should I succumb to this outside mm. system? Mm. But then, you know, if I've got a headache, I take the paracetamol. if I'm yeah. ill, I go to the doctor. Yeah. So why is it when it comes to willpower, I'm averse to it? Or, mm. Um, mm. There is an aspect of wanting to cultivate discipline and willpower. And I think everyone realizes like it's so powerful when you're a disciplined person. Mm. But um, I think for me, um, for me, primarily, it's like, okay, what gets the job done? Like, yeah. first, let me get the job done in terms of let me stop wasting three hours a day on my phone. Yeah. yeah. Then once that's sorted and that's kind of automated, if you like. Now let me cultivate discipline in other way parts of my life because you got to pick your battles, I suppose, right? Yeah. So I don't want to go to war with ten thousand Instagram engineers, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who are like some of the the best in the world in terms of they all coming from the best unis and all of that. I'm not. I don't want to go. That's not a battle I'm choosing to fight. So yeah. I'm going to you know hire the good people from Freedom to to just block it for me. <laughs> <laughs> so. Yeah. crazy isn't it it's, don't you feel like weak in a certain way but then there's also this strength in accepting your weakness I've always mm. I've, I've kind of gone full circle with it like I always had this notion that oh no I want to do things on my own I don't want to rely on anybody Yeah, I still don't rely mm. on anybody for anything mm. but in terms of like systems that I'm in control of that I can mm. set up um, I've always been averse to that mm. but up the, until the, recently you did make the decision though in, in putting whatever system in place it's True. still your decision. So I think I find some power in that. But I then also I accept that خُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ ضَعِيفَ Yeah, and that that is something that I've kind of adopted and tried to absorb mm. where it's like you can only ex- you have to accept that you're weak mm. to then be in charge of putting systems in place knowing yeah. that your weakness could overtake you um, later on if yeah. you don't do this now whilst you have a bit of strength yeah yeah you so basically protect yeah. yourself from yourself kind of thing yeah and for me it's like i suppose maybe it's um also the knowledge that helps me so may, maybe the average person doesn't realize that there are i don't know exactly the size of the team but it might be a hundred people inside of instagram whose 
full-time job is to get you to spend more time on Instagram. Yeah. yeah. Oh, so the, yeah. the knowledge that that, the knowledge that that exists, it almost ma makes you not feel weak to just block Instagram because you're like, mm. you realize it's a hundred against one <laughs> and those guys, uh, their full-time job is that. Whereas how much resources and time can you spend resisting it? So yeah, I don't yeah. feel weak in blocking stuff for that reason. That's one thing. And then it's like picking a battle, like I said. So I'm, I'm deciding not to fight a battle with um, Instagram, for example. But I do try and fight a battle in terms of doing uh, a research for a pro product, a project I have um, that I'm working on now. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to challenge myself to spend 30 minutes of nonstop focus on it, you know. So that's a place where... I feel it's 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 a worthwhile battle because mm. if I am to uh, do the kind of things I want to do in my life, I, I just simply need to be able to have nonstop focus for at least 30 minutes kind of thing. Mm. So it's about picking your battles, I think. Yeah, and I suppose once you've got those systems in place, like it kind of, I suppose those are like crutches to develop a habit anyway. Yes. Because yes. it's like a it's like a path that was set out isn't it like um you ever heard those studies where they put they don't make paths at, there was like a campus at uni where they didn't make a path for people to walk mm -hmm. uh, and essentially just let people walk wherever they ended up treading you know on grass that kind of formed its own path and yeah. that's where they put the path yeah because i think in left their own devices kind of thing i think in because uh, you know i studied urban design i think we call it desire lines Ooh. So I'm, I'm I'm preaching to the choir, bro. <laughs> <laughs> I just remembered one thing from my degree. Well done. <laughs> oh God, tell me about it, bro. That's a, that's another thing. People are like, oh, did you enjoy your degree? I'm like, I remember what degree? Me, like, yeah, I remember like one thing, and it was like this concept of a prison, and it was like that's the only thing I can remember. Mm. This specific weird thing of about this particular prison where uh, the guards could see every prisoner, but the prisoners couldn't see the guard, kind of thing. Mm. Um, that's all I remember, bro. That's all I remember. <laughs> it's going to get me a good job one day. <laughs> but yeah. But I mean, like we're saying, like, for me, bro, I believe um, if I'm thinking about my son and future kids, what's like the, the, some of the main skills that they need? Um, I'm not thinking about like geography or physics. I'm not thinking about, I'm thinking of discipline, for example, mm. uh, delayed gratification. These are going to be yani, the number one assets and skills in the in the coming 50 years. I don't Definitely. have a doubt about that. Emotional intelligence. Um, these things are going to become so important. And so, uh, yeah, I just I must cultivate some level of that in myself. And then that's what I want ultimately them to gain more than specific grades and specific thing. And that's what you get from a degree. It's not saying I know all there is to know about criminology it's saying i was disciplined enough to do x amount of essays and yeah. understand this amount of text and read this many books and i think that's what they value isn't it like employers and stuff value that uh, that's why you get like graduate schemes that don't really care what you studied it's just yeah as long as you did that mm. they um, understand that and more and more yeah. people are saying you know who cares what degree you have you know show me what you can do show me what you've done you know these yeah. kind of thing yeah, yeah so yeah, so yeah definitely so oh, yeah he's making um he's the, the little boy's making like noises i think he's hungry i think i'm gonna have to wrap it back. up here bro if that's okay of course it's it's been a perfect time to wrap up i think is it's, it's been you know one of the maybe maybe one of the top in the last 10 episodes is probably one of the top one or two something like that i think it's been really bro, good every episode is a banger bro <laughs> i'm halfway through listening to the last one you did on your own yeah was that all right do you think oh yeah it's good it's good because you got i like it bro because it gives me an opportunity to be like oh how's it mean doing this have a check-in i suppose <laughs> it can be difficult isn't it because you've got a you don't have time to think yes through. yeah but it's one of those ones that you can sort of plan and then talk about and it doesn't have to be as long yeah it needs um, planning definitely to make it good um, otherwise, there's a lot before. of umming and ahhing. Have I done one on my own? I don't think I've done one yet. Mm, no, I don't. Uh, think, I think you you uh, did with your wife when I wasn't available or something. Yeah, but yeah, alhamdulillah, it's been a good episode. Um, like I said, guys, once again, if you've got any input that you want to add, want to be part of the Mind Heist discussion, then. 
please send us an email and all our contacts and links and stuff are on at mindheistpodcast.com um what else what else what else what else that's everything man i think that's pretty much it isn't that's it? everything yeah. we're not doing anything anymore <laughs> um i'm taking things easy uh as easy as i can I'm, like even I haven't been very active on social media or anything like that mm-hmm. uh, even the graphic design stuff i've sort of put on a pause <coughs> mm-hmm. um until i can get a bit of a balance going and a bit of a routine going mm. um what else make dua for the little little bubs <laughs> and, and my wife um make dua for the mind heist team aka me and amin like <laughs> Just, just make dua, bro. Everyone make dua about everything. Just, just ask Allah. Have a conversation. That's your goal of the day. If you're mm-hmm. listening to this and you want to have a goal today, then have a conversation with Allah Subhanahu wa Taala and um, and better your better your connection there, inshallah. Mind heist homework. Mind heist homework. <laughs> <laughs> That's it from me. How about yourself? Anything to add? Uh, I said it in the last episode as well. Please do give us um, feedback, corrections. Like, I mean, honestly, if you if you just uh, leave a comment, uh, let's say on YouTube, or you leave a comment just like venting, that's not feedback. Like, that's not helping us improve. Like, we're open minded to being wrong. So please do. You know, I feel, like I said, it's like a kind of a duty to help us improve. So please do that. And uh, yeah, go to mindhousepodcast dot com to do that. And yeah, man. If, even if you have like uh, ideas for episodes, please send those in and share an episode if you really liked it. And, 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 and. Okay. Oh, okay. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> as, as I mean, famously said once. <laughs> <laughs> Stuff, I'm never going to let it down. <laughs> okay, uh, then, alhamdulillah. Okay, subhanakallahumma, bihamdika, shadu, anna ilaha, anta, astaghfirullah, tawwilay. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah, everyone.